do we have everybody from the pickup rooms already? Yeah, they're closed. Yeah, I think so. I think they're closed. Okay, perfect. All right, I guess uh, we should get started. Um, so, um, let me share my screen. So were there, first of all, I guess, were there any um, general uh, wrap up things that people wanted to talk about uh, after the transcriptomics and proteomics session? Any general questions or the instructors who are here for the sessions? Anything anybody wants to bring up? I had a question on the proteomics exercise, the third one. I had noticed mm -hmm. that, you know, we wanted to look at the intersect uh, one was we were looking at threefold um, difference, and the second was only one and a half fold. Is there a biological reason why you would want to have a different threshold on the fold changes? Yeah, I mean, I can give a general answer um, when it comes to fold change. Um, there, are a couple. So, one factor is what kind of experiment it was uh, and I'll, I'll start off by saying there's no magic answer right so for right, example right. Uh, in the world of when microarray analysis for example um, people always use the gold standard of um, a, a, a change of twofold was considered um, you know significant or big right that's something that you would look for you always look for a twofold uh, difference um, but then it depends on the experiment. There were some microarrays where the signal um, was was uh, uh, was weak, and actually, you know, going down to one point five may actually show you something that's biologically relevant potentially. Um, now, when you look at RNA seq data, for example, the dynamic range is much higher. So, yes, you know, you can still do a twofold change, but you will often get things that are hundreds of fold different between each other. Whereas in microarrays, you would never get that. You maybe get up to six fold difference would be really, really high or almost maximum, um, you know, fold difference in microarrays versus in um, RNA-seq, the dynamic, dynamic range is much wider. So then you could, you, when you play around with fold change with RNA-seq data, you can play around with that number a lot more, right? You can change a lot more, make it bigger, make it um, and so forth. Same thing happens with, with the proteomics data. It really depends on the experiment. I know from some experiments we have, uh, if you try to do a full change of anything higher than 2.5, you got no results. <laughs> it doesn't mean that the experiment was invalid. It just meant that that's the, the, the level of uh, detection that particular experiment, that particular assay had. Um, and so, uh, so it's kind of somewhat arbitrary. So uh, choosing 1.5 or two or three you know, sometimes you have to play around with an experiment and see, well, what is the maximum that you can set? Um, and, and then sort of, you know, taper that down and see what you get. Ultimately, you want to look at the results, right? And say, well, I'm seeing these things that are differentially regulated. Do they make sense? Are there things in my result set that actually make sense? Which, which you expect those to be differentially regulated or is all of a sudden, you know, every single gene <laughs> In their result, differentially regulated because you're looking at a full change that's that's too close. Um, I don't know if anybody else wants to add to this. Um, and hopefully it helps. It's not a it's not a um, great answer. You know, it's not a you know. It's like it, it would be nicer if you can always say, well, with you know, with quantitative proteomics, you always do a one point five fold. That's a that's that's a good fold difference. With microarrays, it's always two fold. With RNA seq, it's always six fold or something. But uh, but you can't really do that. Yeah, that's perfect. Thank you. That makes a lot of sense. Cool. Okay, any other general questions? So just one thing about transcriptomics and proteomics data that we load in our resources is, is that, you know, you're really given this up, well, the, what it provides to you, to the to the users of our resources is a is a way for you to query the data again, right? So this is data that's been published and you can reuse it basically. And I think that's pretty powerful. Um, and, and the other thing that the strategy system allows you to do, it allows you to combine then results from multiple experiments, which I think is, is equally powerful. You don't, you don't have to stick to one RNA-seq experiment. You don't have to stick to only one type of transcriptomic experiment. And you don't even have to stick to transcriptomics. You can move up to proteomics and then integrate other types of data uh, into a search strategy. So 
Um, so, so I think that's that's pretty cool and pretty pretty effective in, in allowing you to discover some new things that you may want to work on or explore further. Okay, so um, there aren't any other questions. We can we can come back to this topic. Uh, but what we're going to do right now is um, I'm going to give you a short intro on on usage of Galaxy, what Galaxy is, and and how you can use it in in ViewPath DB resources. Um, this is going to be short, so just about 20 minutes or so, just giving you a brief intro. Uh, then we'll have a break. Then we'll come back, and Catherine is going to show us uh, the new integration of uh, single cell data and ViewPath DB resources and how you can access it and play around with it. Um, and then we'll wrap up the day with a discussion on uh, orthology with some uh, optional homework if you want to do it. And, and obviously, we're available as usual at the end of the day for any um, uh, general questions. Um, Tomorrow morning, we'll we'll come back to Galaxy and we'll look at some of the output results. And, and Catherine and I will look at some of the output results from let's say an RNA sequence analysis and, and talk about the various um, uh, results that you see. Um, so uh, Carlos is asking about uh, Translatome analysis. Can you maybe can you just explain, or maybe somebody else can explain what a translatome is? Um, so it's, it's when it's when you sequence it's only the RNA that are bound to the ribosome. So ah. you are not you are not sequencing everything. So you are so ribosome the, like a ribosome profiling. Um, yes, uh, at the ribosome profiling is just to see the, yes. the correlation between proteomic analysis and yeah and translatomic so we, analysis, which is I think is better or not. Sure, sure. So we do integrate ribosome profiling data um, in um, in uh, our resources. So depending on whether the data is available or not, uh, we it's treated just like RNA seq data, right? It's just simply that these are it's coming from RNA seq that is um, enriched where ribosomes are basically. So presumably that's um, um, those are transcripts that are being translated um, at that moment in time when you did the experiment. And so we do have some of that data in the resource. Uh, you search it via the RNA sequence search because it is ultimately uh, the output is RNA seq um, uh, reads, um, and um, and then you can combine that with proteomics data and see if there's correlation. Um, I can tell you from at least the, the I haven't delved into it in a huge amount, but uh, and, and Suzanne put a link to an example, one of those examples. Um, you know, sometimes you see nice correlations and sometimes you don't, and it's hard to, you know, between that and the actual protein that's coming out or between that and whether a protein is actually being um, translated at that moment in time. Um, so that's a bit tricky, but the data does exist and we do integrate it there. And I think the more data we get, data types uh, of a particular, the more data we get of a particular data type, then uh, the more sort of power you have, because then you can integrate multiple experiments and and see what the results look like. So. Okay, thank you, Mark. Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, I'm going to switch to uh, talking about a Galaxy and um, quickly just going to my to the homepage of ViewPathDB or any of the resources. Um, you'll notice under Tools. Um, from one of the options is this option to go to Galaxy. You have to be logged in because you're you're using you're using some space uh, that's linked to your account, and you'll be uploading data in your private workspace uh, to analyze it. So, I'll give you a couple of quick um, tidbits. So, Galaxy is a um, resource we didn't develop it. We're we're using it from another resource. So, some of you may be familiar with the usegalaxy.org resource. Um, there are mirrors of this resource. There's a usegalaxy.eu and there's a usegalaxy.au uh, Australia. Uh, I think it's AU, but anyway, there's an Australian uh, um, mirror of the Galaxy site. Um, and those are public Galaxy sites that anybody can go in and, and access. And you have a certain amount of uh, space that you can, um, that you can use um, in these resources and then um, and then access the various bioinformatic tools uh, in that resource. So um, what is Galaxy? So Galaxy is basically a, a web-based platform um, that integrates 
uh, bioinformatic tools in a um, uh, web interface that allows you to run them without having to use command line operations. Uh, and so for many of us who are, who are not, um, um, you know, who don't understand how to use um, Linux or don't know how to use Linux um, or uh, install software um, <clears throat> locally, um, then it is, um, it is obviously um, much harder to do experiments on your own. And so as a result, uh, it becomes hard for you to replicate experiments or analyze your own data. You're continuously dependent on a bioinformatician to run these analyses. So what Galaxy allows you to do is to run some of these experiments on your own. Um, so even, even if, it's, if you have a very complex experiment that ultimately you're going to require um, having a bioinformatician help you, uh, what Galaxy lets you do is, is maybe run a sample of your data through a, um, a pipeline of, of, of bioinformatic tools, uh, software basically, um, and, and it helps you in two ways. One is you can look at the data yourself, uh, maybe get a quicker answer for, for what you're working on. Uh, and secondly, it helps you understand the various steps that a bioinformatician would took, take in, in analyzing data. And I think that's super important and, 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 and helpful to um, um, to the basic wet lab biologist. And so any, and Galaxy is a, is a software platform that can be installed. Um, uh, anybody can install it um, at a you know, university setting. It, you can install it on your laptop, obviously, but uh, or maybe you could, but it's, but it's, it's very uh, heavy handed. It requires somebody to actually maintain it. Um, so some universities have their own Galaxy interface for various departments, but they typically have somebody who is dedicated to maintaining the platform because somebody has to make sure the software is all up to date. Um, software have dependencies on each other and they have to make sure that these are working you have to make sure you have the right amount of space available and you can access it and so forth. Um, but the cool thing about it is that um, um, is that um, all of the Galaxy platforms will look the same. So here I'm looking at the main sort of use Galaxy resource. If you go to the ViewPathDB um, uh, Galaxy, you will get a page that looks like this um, or a page that looks like this. These are all um, uh, you know, these are within, uh, within ViewPathDB. Um, here's a, a workflow that I ran that came up with some errors that happens, uh, right? And so anytime, just like in an experiment you do in the lab, sometimes you, you have mistakes, whether it is something you did as a mistake or uh, the enzyme went bad. And so this, this could happen as well. Um, but ultimately, what you uh, can do in a Galaxy interface, and I'm going to now switch just to the, to the ViewPath TV Galaxy interface, is you can um, select any of the tools right here on the left. And you can see that they're categorized the NGS applications or data transfer. Uh, if you go down, you'll see uh, there are microarray tools, uh, various data manipulation tools, statistical tools, and it goes on and on and on. Um, and this is not all the tools that are available to the Galaxy world. There, there are hundreds and hundreds of tools that are available in something called the Galaxy Tool Shed. And so, uh, so one can install um, um, additional tools into your Galaxy uh, interface depending on, on, on what's being done. And so often you might, if, if your university has their own Galaxy installation, uh, this left-hand section may look very different. It may have different tools installed here um, that were requested by um, people working uh, at that particular institution. And so, these uh, so these tool can tools on the left can be just act you know run uh, by just looking for them. So, for example, um, if I want to align um, some RNA seq data. I might look for a tool called uh, HiSat2, which is an, an aligner. Uh, and so I can just click on this. And here is the, the web interface that allows me to select, you know, you have to load some data and you have to, you know, um, so it can analyze it, but then you can configure it to run the alignment to, um, uh, of your data against the genome. Okay, so that's pretty cool. So you already have access to a bioinformatic tool that typically would be much harder to run without a web interface. The really cool thing about, about Galaxy is that it allows you to build workflows. So just like in the lab, when you uh, just run a simple enzymatic digest and, and take it all the way through to running it on gel and maybe cutting a band out of a gel and, and, and purifying it, you're essentially running a workflow in the lab, you know, starting with 
taking your DNA, mixing it with your enzyme uh, and a buffer, and then putting it in um, a, a 37 degree incubator, and then taking it out and purifying your DNA. So you're you're doing this workflow, a stepwise workflow, um, to ultimately get to a result in the end, which may be um, a picture, right, of a, of a gel, which is is a is kind of a dead end, right? You look at it; these are the results. You put it in your lab book, and you're done. Or maybe you'll cut the gel out, cut a little band out of your gel, and take it further, purify it, digest it, uh, ligate it into a plasmid, uh, and then express that in a in a parasite, and and see if you have GFP fluorescence, for example, right? So, so that's you know where you you know you may have results coming out of a workflow or a step that you take on to the next um, to the next uh, phase of the experiment. Um, and so in bioinformatics, in the bioinformatics world, it's the same thing you'll have a workflow and typically you have multiple steps starting with your input, which is your, your, your data. In this case, instead of your DNA and your enzyme, you have your, your data. Um, and then you have a bunch of operations that you will run on this data. And those could be aligning to the genome, um, taking the alignment and uh, determining the, the uh, uh, level of expression for each gene in the genome, then taking that and comparing it to another sample and determining the differential expression between them, right? So these are all different steps that you're applying on the data and the outputs of the various analyses. And so um, in the Galaxy world, what's pretty cool, I'm gonna go to uh, workflows and I'm just gonna create a new workflow. And let's call this um, uh, just an MSA, multiple sequence alignment, and I'm gonna save this. And what happens then is you get this empty canvas here which allows you then to build your workflow from the tools on the on the left. And what I did did not mention right here on the on the right hand side, it'll either give you information about the tools if you're in the uh, in the um, uh, workflow workspace and you're building a workflow, or if you're looking at a um, at results, which I will show you later. It's a place where you can actually uh, see your history. It's like a folder, basically, with everything that happened in your in your workflow, and then you can access <clears throat> and manipulate the the results of the of the workflow. Okay, so what I'm going to do is quickly build a, a very small workflow, a multiple sequence alignment, and so uh, and I'm just going to demonstrate this so you see how 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 easy it is, in fact, to do it. So first of all, we're going to start with um, input, and so. Um, so we need an input data set. So I'm just gonna select input data set. And so you get this little box here, which signifies that you have to have input data, right? This input data is gonna go somewhere else. So you're gonna do something to this input data. So I'm gonna look for something that allows me to align and uh, hopefully everybody's heard of uh, uh, tools, the cluster tools. And so there's cluster W, cluster Omega. Um, I'm gonna pick one of these. I'll pick, uh, I don't know, let's just pick cluster Omega. And we'll put it here. And when you click on this, you'll notice on the right hand side here, you get different parameters that you can you can set for this tool. You can always come back and modify this, right? And so, um, but you can see that um, this tool um, it gives you information about the tool, um, potentially what the tool is looking for, and it tells you here the input sequence. The input is going to be in FASTA format, FASTA format. And if you're not familiar with about what FASTA format is, I'll show you an example of what it looks like. But basically, it's a, it's a text file. So let's go here. I have a FASTA file right here. So here's a FASTA file. It's a structured text file. So in many cases, um, the, the files that are you're using in, in bioinformatics, in the bioinformatics world, in many cases, not always, they're text files. They're just structured in a certain way that the software that's going to do something with that file will understand what that structure is, right? And so in this case, many software will be able to read a FASTA file and the software will know what to expect. It'll know that there's gonna be this greater than sign. This greater than sign indicates something called a def line or which has information. This can be anything. It could be a gene ID. It could be the name of the organism. It could be your favorite pet name. It doesn't matter. There's, there's information here that's for you, that's informative. The next line after the def line is sequence. So it's expecting either amino acid sequence or nucleotide sequence. And then once it hits another greater than sign, it knows, well, that's that's the next def line. So I'm expecting now another sequence after this until I see another greater than sign. Okay. So that's the structure of a FASTA file. We will talk, uh, if we have time today, I'll, I'll, I'll show a FASTQ file. 
but it's the same thing. A fast queue is for, for the um, high throughput sequencing data. And it's a structured file again. It's a text file. It's structured. It has a particular order of things. And programs that will use a fast queue file are looking for that particular structure. And without that structure, you'll get an error. The program will fail. Say, well, I didn't get a faster file. I can't do anything with it. And it throws an error. OK? So back to our workflow. I have my input data. I have my cluster omega. It's expecting a faster file. So I'm going to now need to connect my input data to my cluster omega. So I'm going to click on this little arrow here, it turns green, move it over, and now I have a connection. So the input data, which is going to be something I'm going to upload, it's going to go to my cluster omega. And now I may be done. I may say, okay, I'm going to just be running alignments. Or you may decide I'm going to try and, 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 and uh, run a tree on this alignment. And so let's find out if we can find another tool that allows me to run a tree. So I'm just typing tree up here, seeing what comes up. And here are a couple of options. There's a fast tree or a neighbor joining. Let's just pick this maximum likelihood tree. I can move this over here. And again, you look at it, it tells you what it's expecting, what kind of uh, input it's expecting. It's also expecting a faster file uh, of the alignment. And you can see here the cluster of Omega, it tells you what the output files are. And one of them is a faster file right here. This is looks like a log file. So if you try and connect this to the next step, it's not gonna be able to do anything with it unless you're you specifically have a tool that's going to analyze your log file. But in this case, we know it needs a FASTA file. We know there's an output here that's FASTA. So I'm going to connect the FASTA file output to the, uh, to the FAST tree tool. OK? So I'm going to save this. So now I'm going to go back to my um, workspace. And now I have an empty workspace here. So the middle portion here is, is basically uh, um, informational. So if we look at the use Galaxy site, they put a lot of information here. They have the support Ukraine thing here. They have other information here. You can do whatever you want in this middle section. And in, um, in the ViewPathDB uh, Galaxy world, we have um, we have tools here and pre-configured workflows for you to allow you to, um, to run your own analysis. So you'll notice that in the middle section, we have a, an ortho MCL tool, which I'll talk about later today. Um, we have RNA sequence analysis options, um, whether it is for uh, just looking at the uh, transcript per million for each um, uh, sample you're looking at or experiment, or if you want to uh, create differential expression analyses. We have, and you'll notice there are different workflows. They're described here, paired end versus, uh, uh, paired end stranded versus paired and unstranded, and the same thing for single ended and, and uh, stranded and unstranded. Um, and so you'll have to obviously know what, what, is, what is your data. Did you do a, a paired end experiment? Was your, was your kit a, a stranded kit? And so you have stranded data. Do you care about the stranded data that you have in your data, in your experiment, or you just want to do a differential expression? Um, so those are things that, that will, be, will come into play as you decide which workflow to use. Okay. So, so we have some pre-configured workflows. But in, in my case, I developed a workflow which, we, which I saved. And so now the next thing is I need to upload my FASTA file, right? I need to input a FASTA file into my experiment. And so I'm just going to go up here. There's a little icon here, uh, which allows you to upload files. Uh, there should be a link somewhere here. Uh, probably get data is the same link, the same thing. But if I click on this, it's going to open up a window that allows me to upload data. This works really well when you have small files. And I'll show you if you're trying to, we'll talk about this in a bit. If you're trying to transfer large files, like a whole RNA, Oh, sorry, is there a question? Or... I think, Ritu, are you trying to ask a question or are you just unmuted? Okay, I will mute Ritu. Okay, there we go. All right. Um, so, um, okay. So, um, if you want to upload large data, there's a different way of doing this, and I will I will show it to you in a second. So now I'm going to just upload a, a small data set, the FASTQ file that I that I showed you, the FASTA file that I showed you. So here it is, and so let's open this, and so here it is. There's um, there's a weird bug actually in Galaxy. You'll notice this. if I try and upload it like this, it's gonna it's gonna give me um, some trouble because it it's not auto detecting the genome, which is fine. I typically just pick the first one. It doesn't really matter. It's not going to do anything with this. So, so you can ignore the step for now until this is fixed. But I'm just going to start this. And so now what happens, it's, it tells me, OK, it, it worked. I can, or it, it, it gave the order to upload the file. 
I can close this. You'll notice here on the right, very quickly, it uploaded the file. I can open it. I can click on it, open it. I see that my file contains 143 sequences. I get a quick synopsis of what's in that file. If I click on this little view icon, it shows me the FASA file. This is exactly the FASA file I was looking here at my computer. So it is available to me here. Um, I, can, I can edit some of the attributes um, and there are different things you can do with it depending on the, on the type of data that you have. Okay, so I have my FASTA file. Um, you know, you can give your history a name. I can call this the SPP pace alignment. Um, and now I want to run a workflow on this. So I'm just gonna to go to my workflows because I, I created a, um, this step, uh, this workflow and it's called MSA. So I'm just gonna go ahead and click on run workflow. And so I'll click on run and, oh, give me a server internal error. Let's try it again. Uh, it worked. So I just had to reload the page. So now you'll notice that um, this is my MSA workflow. It's a really small workflow. I can expand to look at the full workflow. So these are the steps that are gonna run in my workflow. Uh, it's gonna run the cluster Omega and it's gonna run this fast tree on my, on my workflow. I, and you can see there are different parameters that I can play around with. You know, if I was running this command line, these parameters would be things that you would add into your command. And the, so the cool thing is that they're, they're available to you right here. Okay, so in this case, because it's a very simple workflow, there's, there's really not much I'm gonna change here. Um, uh, I've selected, it's automatically selected the FASTA file that's in here, which is great. Um, and I'm going to run this workflow. And so what happens if, if everything works, um, it tells me that, okay, it, this, is, uh, this seems to be working. It starts some of the jobs that are aligning and, and the ones that are waiting, for example, this job is gonna wait for the FASTA file from here. It's just waiting and, and it's gonna be gray. Um, if, it, if a job works, it's gonna turn green. If it fails, it's gonna turn red. Just like I showed you right here, I had a bunch of red ones. It didn't work for me here. Um, so we'll see if it works here. Um, um, but, but the point is that now this is, this is running, okay? Um, all right. So I did do this before, so I'm gonna to switch to this workflow and you'll notice that um, one of the steps in the workflow did not work. So the fast tree in the end did not work, unfortunately, but my alignment did work. And so I can look at this and you can see here's my, my multiple sequence alignment. This is a multifast A, the, the gaps in here indicate the, um, um, the, um, uh, the alignment. Um, so for some reason, the faster, um, uh, the tree is not, not working for some reason. There could be multiple reasons for this. So it could be user error. Um, I did something which I haven't done before and that's I included this information when I downloaded the, the sequence. Maybe it doesn't like this and it should just be the ID. So I'll, I'll play around with this and figure it out. So if I figure out by tomorrow, I'll show you what, this, what the results of the, of the fast tree uh, look like. Okay, any, any questions so far? And sometimes you can look at this error and see if you can figure out what is what is going on. Okay. Um, so the other option, um, and I'm gonna try this right now because I'm, I'm just curious. I'm gonna look at the tree options and let's go down to, I'm gonna try this neighbor joining one. Let's see if that does anything. Let's execute. So basically I, I selected another tool. Um, it's gonna pick, uh, pick the fast output from my alignment uh, and we'll see what happens. I'll let this run, um, it might work. So sometimes you can play around with it that way. Okay, any questions so far or any comments from any of the other instructors? Okay. So, um, I mentioned that you know you can upload data from your from your computer and, and, and that's the sort of the easy way to do it by by clicking this upload. Um, but there are um, other ways of uploading data, especially when it's uh, large data sets. Um, and so we have uh, the re so we don't maintain our own Galaxy instance. It's because it is it takes a um, a lot of effort to do that. We have, um, uh, we contracted with another group called uh, Navapoint. They maintain our Galaxy instance and they use something called uh, Globus uh, Data Transfer or Endpoint um, that, uh, that allows fast transfer of data from different um, places. So if I click on Globus Data Transfer, 
you will see that there are multiple um, uh, types of um, ways to upload data or get data into your resource. So you'll notice here on the right, they, these steps fail. So, so something is either wrong in my previous step or the tool is, is broken. And so we'll, I'll just have to report this to the Mavicon group. Okay, so, um, um, so back to getting data. So I can get data via Globus High Speed. That's if I wanna upload data from my laptop. And to do this, you have to install something called a, a Globus Connect endpoint. And there, there are some pretty detailed instructions here on how to do this. You have to install something called the Globus Connect uh, um, uh, endpoint on your machine, whether it's a, a Windows or a Mac, everything is in here. And then it'll uh, once you upload, once you have this installed, you can upload data into your Galaxy instance. And it's, it's pretty fast and works for very large data sets. Another way to get data, and I'm going to just open a, um, New, uh, let's see, I'm gonna create a new history right here, an empty one. Another way is you can get data from um, different repositories where data is stored. So for example, I can get data from the EBI server. And for here, for this, I can go to, um, and we have a bunch of exercises that walk you through, for example, how to run an RNA sequence or, or a variant calling analysis. Um, and I'm just gonna pick one of these uh, files um, these sample names, these you get these from the sequence read archive or EBI. Um, and I know that this data set is a, is a paired end data set. And so I'm gonna select paired end and I'm gonna execute this. And so what now, what, what this endpoint or the Globus Connect endpoint is gonna do, it, it sends a message to EBI server. Nothing is happening on your computer. It basically says, okay, this is a, um, a paired end data set. Uh, this is a sample number, give me the pairs and then it starts working on it. And hopefully it'll work. Hopefully there isn't something wrong. Sometimes there's something wrong with the Amazon cloud and things just fail. But ultimately what will happen is the data will transfer and, and hopefully these will be green. So I'm gonna go here to my uh, history um, and I'm just gonna pick a uh, previous history that I had, switch to this one. And so when you look at this, this is what a, um, um, a workflow that worked this is what it should look like. You should see lots of green, hopefully. And um, when you import ex import your data, um, it should look something like this. So you'll see a FASTQ file. Remember I told you FASTQ files are just like FASTA files, they're structured text files. And so here you can see that there's a, a repeating structure. It starts with an at sign. There's some information here at the top. This information is tells you something about the machine uh, that it came from that was sequenced on, the location on the slide, the length of the read, um, and then the next line is the actual sequence of the read, followed by this plus symbol, followed by, by, the, by the quality scores for each of the nucleotides. So each of the, the nucleotides gets a quality score. This is in something called ASCII code. So it's, it's compressed. Um, it's, it's a, so it's a single digit for two digit values. The values are usually you know, in the range of, I don't know, 30 to 60, depending on the, on the technology or lower if it's bad quality. Uh, and that's encoded in this ASCII, ASCII code. And this will go on for millions and millions and millions of rows, right? So this is an RNA-seq experiment. And so, so that'll be how the data is represented. So anything that will work with FASTQ files is expecting this type of structure. Okay, so that's, that's the important thing here. Um, okay, so very quickly, I'm gonna just go back here to my workflow. Um, and the cool thing about this is obviously, we'll, we'll talk about some of the output of this workflow tomorrow. Uh, so for example, in this experiment, I took um, um, samples from female and male uh, mosquitoes, and I uh, compared them to each other. So it has biological replicates, um, and I ran um, I ran one of these workflows right here that are available. So this one here for differential expression. If I click on this, it will open up the workflow, and it allows me to select the sample. So for example, in this case, I can pick. I want to compare males to females. And then you can go to each of the steps and there are some configurations. For example, you have to tell it which genome you want to align this to. So you'd have to, obviously that's something you would know depending on the experiment you're doing. So you'd have to go in here and find the genome version. This is, while I'm doing this, uh, to let you know that this is one advantage of the, the ViewPathDB Galaxy is that we preload all the genomes um, uh, that are in ViewPathDB. In each release, we preload them and so they're available to you. Typically, if you go to the, use Galaxy side where you can run these same workflows, 
you would have to upload the genome as well because the use galaxy site just has no idea what genome do you want there are so many out there so they don't preload all genomes for us in our galaxy instance we preload all the genomes so you can you can go down to, to for example to vector base and um, you know, I don't remember which mosquito this was. Let's say this was Anopheles. So I'm just going to go down and, and look for it. And um, you find the, the genome of interest and you um, uh, select it. So let's, let's assume it was Anopheles, Gambia, Peston. So you select it here. <clears throat> Depending on the workflow, of course, each step in the workflow will have certain requirements. And, and in this case, I'm, I will discuss this tomorrow just for the sake of time, but I'll, I'll show you the workflow RNA-seq analysis tomorrow and talk about the different steps in the RNA-seq analysis, but there's an alignment step and the alignment step needs to know what genome it needs to align it to. And then there's another step called um, um, uh, HTC count, and that's gonna uh, generate counts on your, um, on your genes based on your annotation. And so again, it needs to know which genome you're gonna run this on. So you have to do all of these things to to before you can run it. If you don't select the right genome, obviously things are going to fail, or you're going to get some really weird results. And so that's uh, definitely something you have to sort of take care of. But again, without even running this, if you take the time to walk through each, each of these steps to understand how an RNA sequence analysis is done, you're you know one step ahead because you've, you've, you you this is a nice tool to learn how to um, how some of these analyses are done. Um, Ultimately, you get your results. You can explore them. So, for example, I can go and look at uh, the DEC output. Uh, there's a PDF, and, and we'll, we'll talk about these outputs tomorrow. Um, you can visualize them. It'll it'll give you an idea about the uh, what the data looks like, and if it's uh, if you're happy with the data. Um, there are BAM files, which are the alignment files, and we convert them to BigWig files, which is a different format that that shows you the the coverage plots. For RNA sequence data that you can load in, in the genome browser in, in ViewPathDB. Um, and so what we did is we, we added an additional feature in, in the Galaxy tool, which allows you to export data to ViewPathDB. And so if I go down to the export, the ViewPathDB export tools, I can say I want to export the RNA sequence data to ViewPathDB. And when I click on this, I can uh, give this a name, uh, that's my best experiment. And um, uh, you can tell it uh, where the, which bigwig files to transfer, um, what are the TPM values that you're going to transfer, and, and so on. So I could already pre-configured this and, and, and set it up, so I can show you how it is. Um, data summary, I'm just going to copy and, and paste this here, and then you can execute this and, and send it over to, um, uh, to ViewPathDB. Okay? So that then generates another export step right here, and, and it'll export the data to ViewPathDB. So once um, this is exported, um, uh, it, sometimes it takes some time. So I'm just going to go to a vector base. Uh, this was a vector data set. I already um, pre-did this, so I'm going to log in. Okay, so now I'm in, I'm in my workspace. Um, if I go to my workspace, I can go to my data sets. And now when you go to my data sets, it'll list all the data sets that I've been, I've been working on. Uh, and, and this same data set I had, had exported in the past, so it didn't make sense for me to export it again right now, but as you'll see here, the male versus females. And so I can go here, this is private. This is, I'm the only one who can see this because I've, I've sent it to my own private workspace. You get your own data set page. And then the cool thing is now I can start asking questions about this data using the full change search, or I can visualize the data in the genome browser. So I'm gonna just go ahead to the full change search. You already were doing this in the, in the previous exercise, but now you can do it on your own experiment, right? So I can say, well, I wanna compare the females to the males, and I wanna find any gene that's upregulated by, um, we can keep it at average, um, and let's make this tenfold. So I wanna find anything that's upregulated in females compared to males by at least tenfold comparing the average between the samples. And when you click on this, you'll get a result in your strategy. So I found 104 genes that met my criteria, which is pretty cool. Um, and you can look at these genes. If I scroll here to the right, you'll get these, um, these graphs that are being um, uh, generated that are, um, um, let's see if I can zoom out a little bit. There we go. Um, and so these graphs that are specific to your data set, which is pretty cool. So you can see, yes, these are truly up in the females compared to the males. Um, 
And then if I go to one of these gene pages, um, here, this is good. You can, here's my positive control, the female reproductive tract protease, right? So that's, that's good that it's upregulated in females compared to males. Um, anyway, I'm gonna pick one of these genes. And so now when you go there to the gene page, give it a second to load. And if we go to the transcriptomic section um, and scroll down, you will notice here that there is a, a user data set transcriptomic graphs. So this is my stuff, this is my data. And so now you'll see the males and females are showing up here as a graph. I'm the only one who sees this. So this gene page now is, it looks basically identical to the gene page you see, except that I have in the my data set section, I have a graph that shows the females versus the males. And so now then I can compare this to other experiments um, available in the, in the, that are preloaded. Um, I don't know if there are any, here's males versus females. And let's see this, what this looks like. And so this gene is truly upgraded by somebody else. Some other experiment is upgraded in females and that matches the results that I found uh, in, in my experiment. Okay, so that's, that's pretty cool. Uh, I can go back to my uh, strategies, look at my 104 and say, well, is there something enriched in these 104? And I think tomorrow we'll talk a little bit about Go enrichment. So I'm gonna quickly analyze my results, just give you a little uh, prelude of this. I can click on Go enrichment, um, you know, and I can ask, well, is there anything enriched uh, using Go terms in my 104 genes that are upgraded in female mosquitoes uh, compared to the males that is enriched over the background that's that's not there by 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 chance, um, and and that's something that you often see in publications where uh, people um, report you know which Go terms were enriched, and so I can see here that there's some progenesis uh, Go term that's enriched. Oops, um, I'm going to do that. Let's go back to back to it. Um, so a progenesis uh, go term that's enriched, um, and and some other things. So then you can explore this and and come up with some ideas about what are the processes that are enriched in your in your samples. And we'll talk more about the various branches of of uh, the gene ontology tomorrow, um, and so you get a better idea of what all of these means and how you can use them. Okay, I think we're we're over time. We're a little bit uh, late, so I'm gonna probably stop here unless there are any uh, any questions from anyone? Yes, I, I have a question. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So thank you for this chance. Uh, uh, yesterday we went through the RNA-seq annotation and we uh, found uh, uh, the evidence for uh, evident, uh, exons, evidence for the uh, based on the exons or entrance or uh, uh, untranslated region and so on. So uh, I want to ask about uh, the transposable, transposable elements. So if I want to uh, annotate the transposable elements, is it same to the annotation of uh, RNA sequence or like this? That's a good question. And so you mean if you want to annotate it in using Apollo um, and, and, and integrate them, is that what you meant? Or yeah, in general, yeah, yeah. I wanted to know, yeah, the, the annotation of the transposable elements in Apollo, and also. Yeah, uh, Uli, do you wanna do you wanna maybe answer that from an annotation? And also, I have uh, additionally and uh, and the uh, the role uh, role of the the, the transposable element in phosphorescent interaction, for example, in particular, in, in case of uh, uh, plasmodium falciparasites. Yeah. I mean, that's a, that's a good question. So, so the short thing is, I don't know the answer as to what is the role of transposable elements in, in host parasite interactions. Um, we don't have tools, I don't think right now for you to analyze that specifically, um, because you would have to obviously do some experiments to determine if they're, if they're uh, active transposable elements during um, uh, infection and so forth. But maybe Uli, can you say something about annotating of transposable elements? Yeah, yes. Um, yeah, good question. Um, I haven't done that yet in Apollo. Um, there should be an option. Um, I think you can uh, choose if you um, if it's a pseudogene, or I think there's also an option for transposable elements. So theoretically, yes, you could, I think, um, annotate them in Apollo. And, and in, terms of, in terms of discovering new or where the transposable elements are, 
Um, I mean, I think there are some tools out there. We don't have them in the resource to automatically detect where transposable elements are. Um, so one option is to, to run a blast basically with some known transposable elements against the genome uh, and see where those are located and if you find anything. Um, but I'm not aware of any other tools that are that could be useful in this case. Uh, maybe somebody else who's on the call can, can make some suggestions, but that's, uh, yeah. Yeah, as I have a, a next question, other question, if possible. Yes, of course. Yeah. yeah. Uh, for Galaxy, um, uh, is it a use, for example, the, uh, if I want to analyze protein uh, prediction structure or, uh, for example, properties? In Galaxy, is it used same tools that are uh, available in other portal? So, uh, other um, yeah. So um, there, there might be definitely there might be some tools for for uh, structure prediction in Galaxy. I don't think we have any of those installed in our resource. But if you look at the use Galaxy site, you can always look for what is available. Oops. Uh, so, if I, for example, if I go in here and look for uh, structure, uh, let's see if something comes up. Um, and so. There's some RNA seq structure prediction. I don't see any proteomic. So we would have to look and see if there's anything in the in the Galaxy tool shed that allows you to do that. It really depends. Some of these the, the protein structure um, prediction algorithms are very um, memory or consume a lot of memory. And so I know that uh, there are some resources out there like iTasser where you can submit one or two proteins at a time, but it takes a few days before you get the results back. Um, I don't think I've seen it in here. So let's see what is. Um... So, Omar, once you're done sharing, I can quickly show in Apollo, so. Okay, sounds good. So there's, for example, um, in, in Use Galaxy, there's an alpha to uh, alpha fold uh, guided prediction. I've never used this in, in Galaxy, but it looks like you can upload your own data and run AlphaFold, which is pretty cool. Actually, I might I might try this later on to see what it's what it's like, because um, this could be an interesting tool to try out. Uh, is this um, Hamad? Is this what you were kind of asking about in terms yes, of yes, looking at, this is what I'm yeah. asking about. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's that. I would recommend trying this out. I I don't have experience doing it myself, so um, so let's see if I. I'm trying to see if I have a, um, so let's see if I still have the sequence. So I have a FASTA file right here. Will it let me take a FASTA file? Let's try this again. Alpha fold two. Um, I'm gonna pick this. I'm gonna execute this and we'll see what happens. <laughs> so it's, it's running in the background just on this FASTA file that I have. Um, actually, while we're doing this, I did run the alignment and the fast tree in the main Galaxy site and that worked. And so, uh, as I was showing you earlier, um, the results of this, uh, let's take a look at them. Uh, so the results look like this, which is, uh, which obviously uh, I can't interpret what it means just by looking at it. There, there looks like there are species IDs and numbers here that tell you something about the distance in the tree. But typically what I do is I would take this uh, format, copy it, and you can go to a resource like um, ITAL, for example, which is the, the uh, interactive tree of life, um, which allows you to generate some, some trees. So I'm going to upload uh, this data. I can just paste the tree right here. Um, we can call it uh, SVP, for example, and I can upload. And then what it does, then it generates a tree for you. Uh, very quickly and, and in a very nice way. And it's, it's super interactive. So I would highly recommend this. You can zoom in and take a look at all of these and, and see where things fall based on the alignment that you ran in, in Galaxy. Okay, any other, other questions? So it looks like the alpha fold failed on, on, on the, the use Galaxy site as well, but it'll be interesting to see what the errors are. And it's possible that I, also did not upload the right file format because I just did this very quickly. But uh, the point is, is that they seem to be have, they have tools here and I would, I would recommend trying them out. Um, the use Galaxy support is, is, uh, is very good actually. I've interacted with them. Uh, and so you can always send them an email and ask them a question if something is not working and they're, and they're very good at responding.
Okay. Um, any other questions? So I would quickly show. Oh yeah. Ahmed yes. Let me let me stop my sharing. Okay. Mm -hmm. So um, we are here in um, Apollo, and so if you have evidence or you can use this option with the right click. There are these different options of what you can choose. And I did show yesterday how to annotate the gene, but there's also the option to annotate transportive elements. So it is definitely possible to do that. Okay, and, thank you. Um, okay, so I think everybody's probably ready for a break. Um, Suzanne and others, I know we ran um, a little bit over. In fact, we took most of the break. <laughs> so uh, do we want to take a half an hour from now um, and then come back? Sure. Are people fine with that? You can get some thumbs up from the attendees or thumbs down. Okay, great. Good, lots of thumbs up, perfect. Right. So, so let's meet back um, uh, in half an hour. So five minutes to uh, the top of the hour and then we'll we'll get situated and and maybe start exactly at at the top of the hour with the next um, uh, session thank you okay see you all soon